So, hello everyone. Despite uh, having quite a large number of antiretrovirals, HIV is, is still incurable, um, but it is manageable uh, in, in developed countries anyway. But what we're seeing now uh, with managed HIV is a lot of complications either caused by the chronic immune activation or perhaps the drugs themselves so that patients are now getting cardiovascular disease, premature cardiovascular disease and, and also uh, non-AIDS related uh, cancers. So it's great to have um, Steve Wessling um, present his lecture today on, on HIV. Steve's uh, research career has primarily focused on HIV uh, neuropathogenesis and he's um, been headhunted time and time again. Um, so he was originally in South Australia, then came to Melbourne, fortunately, for a while, and he was head of infectious diseases at the Alfred Hospital, and then he became director of the, uh, the Burnett and then became dean of medicine at Monash and has now gone back to be director of Shamri, the, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, which has been, been built. So in, in contrast to his research career, which has been very, very focused and um, his, his, uh, his professional career has really been headhunted quite a lot and he's moved around a lot. But it's a great pleasure to have you um, give this lecture. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for, uh, for having me here. I was told <coughs> the lecture was for um, PhD students and postdocs, although I do see a few people with less hair and uh, probably advancing age in the audience. So, um, but I, I thought, uh, when I thought about that, I thought that there are probably a whole heap of PhD students in the audience who weren't alive when HIV started. And uh, so I thought it would be interesting to just to go back over the epidemic. Um, oh yes, I was told to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and just, uh, think about the last 30 years, because it's been 30 years since the, um, the virus was, uh, well, the, the cases first developed, and, uh, and just go through a few of the interesting things that have happened, and then I'll um, talk about some areas which I think are, uh, are very exciting about the future. But essentially, if you want to uh, encapsulate it in a, in a few words, um, we've had HIV for 30 years, 60 million people have been infected, and 30 million people have died. Um, has that changed? No. I'll do it this way. There we go. So the, the, it first started in 1981 and people in New York and San Francisco, um, some of the physicians noticed um, this unusual disease with enlarged lymph nodes and immunosuppression in, in gay men. And by the end of 1981, 160 cases of this new disease had been uh, recorded. Within a couple of years, uh, it became apparent that this was not only something that was happening in the United States, um, but was happening throughout the world and particularly uh, in, in Africa. Um, and within uh, three years, and, and really when you think about the science of HIV, these first 10 or 15 years were, were pretty amazing. So within three years, that isolated the cause. Of, uh, of HIV and AIDS, and uh, it was called HTLV1, HTLV3 to start with. And, uh, and then within a year of the, having the virus, they had an antibody test so that the blood supply was being screened. Unfortunately, between 81 and 85, a lot of people did get contaminated blood, people, particularly people with haemophilia, so there were a lot of uh, HIV cases associated with blood transfusions. Um, but within four years, we had, a, we had the virus and we had an antibody. And within five years, we had a drug that we thought might work, um, and that was AZT. And, uh, and AZT was uh, approved in record time and became the first anti-HIV drug and uh, at the time cost about $10,000 for one year supply which at the time was a very expensive drug, but there's been a lot of drugs since then which are, uh, are much more expensive. Um, but it also, it, at the time, there was a uh, development of a very important um, thing, and that was the relationship between the community affected by HIV and the scientists and the pharmaceutical industry. It wasn't always uh, 
chummy, but it certainly worked very well together in terms of identifying the needs for new drugs, the needs for trials, and the need for, uh, for research. And uh, throughout the history of HIV, that relationship has, uh, has been really important. Also in 87, they prior to that, there was a sense that if you were infected with HIV, you may not develop uh, AIDS or immunosuppression. Um, but by 1987, it became apparent that virtually all cases of HIV infection would lead to full-blown AIDS or severe immunosuppression. Um, but it also, um, people started to be able to measure the incubation period leading to that immunosuppression, um, which was about 10 years. It also, HIV had some interesting impacts on politics, and uh, around that time, the US government um, prevented HIV-infected immigrants and travellers from entering the country. Uh, the impact of that was that the, there was no, they stopped having the international AIDS conferences in, uh, in the US because obviously the community, the HIV-infected community from outside the US couldn't um, um, participate, so they moved them. Also, the, uh, the impact of the HIV epidemic was to look at uh, harm reduction and to look at drug use in a public health way rather than in a justice um, way. And, uh, and if you've been reading The Age in the last few weeks, there's actually this debate is, is starting to come up again in terms of decriminalising um, drugs. But what the HIV um, epidemic caused was for people to think about int intravenous drug use and it demonstrated that giving people clean needles um, didn't necessarily encourage their drug use, but did stop them from getting HIV. And, uh, and this was an area that, that Australia led the world in. And uh, even to this day, the numbers of the percentage of HIV infections in intravenous drug users is less than 1%. It's very low. Whereas even though some of these programs were started in the United States, through the Bush era, um, most, a lot of them were stopped to the point that um, large numbers of um, intravenous drug users in cities like Baltimore or, or New York um, became HIV positive. Also in 1991, uh, Magic Johnson um, announced to the world that he was infected with HIV and, uh, and I'll obviously get on to some of the treatments in a minute. Um, but I was in the US a few weeks ago and Magic Johnson was on TV talking about HIV looking totally um, well and healthy, maybe a little plump. Um, and for those who, who weren't born or weren't around when Magic Johnson was around, he was a very famous basketballer for the LA Lakers. And Freddie Mercury was also the lead singer for a very famous band that um, only the older members of the audience will know about. Um, and he died of AIDS in 1991. Um, in 1993, so we're starting to get sort of 10, 12 years after it started, it was demonstrated that AZT, the drug, the first drug developed, had no impact on the onset of immunosuppression. But a year later, it was demonstrated that AZT could dramatically reduce mother to infant HIV transmission, um, which prior to that was, was in the range of 30 to 40 percent of mothers who are HIV positive were transmitting it to their babies. And uh, AIDS had become the leading cause of death among all Americans between 25 and 44. But although AZT didn't um, uh, seem to work, there continued to be an enormous amount of scientific research and, uh, and it became apparent that if we could um, utilise more than one drug at more than one site in the virus, this might have a, uh, have a better impact and combination therapy started to become available, and the numbers of, and there was a dramatic decline in the uh, in AIDS-related deaths, particularly in, at that point in the developed world. None of these drugs had uh, had any impact, had or had reached the um, developing world at that stage. Uh, and as I mentioned, the impact of AZT on HIV-infected mothers um, had a dramatic effect on the amount of mother-to-infant. Um, transmission. But some of those early drugs also had um, a number of significant side effects, uh, some of which we don't see at all now, and I'm not going to talk about a lot today. 
but um, some of them had dramatic effects on the way fat was distributed around the body. Others had dramatic effects on, on the peripheral nerves and, and certainly my lab did a lot of work on the peripheral neuropathy and the, the way the drugs cause those diseases, particularly through the impact on, on mitochondria. Um, but when, and, and a lot of those side effects um, were first described, particularly by the C David Cooper's group in Sydney, and, uh, and a very important Lancet article on lipodystrophy came out of Sydney that started to change people's thinking about how to utilise these drugs. Um, the drugs have now improved um, significantly uh, and peripheral neuropathy due to drugs has largely disappeared from the developed world, um, but still a problem for some of the cheaper drugs utilised in the developing world. Um, lipodystrophy still continues to be a problem, but much less with some of the newer drugs. But by 1999, it became apparent that this HIV was a problem worldwide, much more than we had thought, and that 95% of all of HIV-infected people now lived in the developing world, um, which was also experiencing 95% of, of AIDS deaths. So there'd been this dramatic move from this epidemic that had affected um, North America, Australia and Europe to moving dramatically into the developing world, um, which had no access to drugs. And so the developed world was now controlling infection. People were living um, with some side effects, but living um, uh, through the infection. And, uh, but in the, in the developing world, there was an enormous amount of infection and death. So this started another, I think, important um, revolution, really, um, and that was the concept that the developed world had a very strong responsibility to move the treatments that are available in the developed world into the developing world, and there was a lot of discussion, controversy, and fights between pharmaceutical industry, researchers, communities, um, but really out of that grew um, global funding for HIV, but also then TB and malaria. And, um, and the Treat Asia network, which, had, uh, which grew both out of the United States, but also particularly out of Australia, um, had a very strong network of hospitals and clinics and um, drug availability. And, um, and over time, the amount of drugs available for treatment in the developing world has, uh, has grown dramatically. And you can see there that from uh, it, HIV became the leading cause of death worldwide of people between 15 and 59. So a, a infection that wasn't uh, in the world 20 years previously had become the biggest um, killer in the world. And there were 40 million people infected. So a few more, um, the, the treatments um, improved again to the point that HIV transmission in the US from mother to child became less than 2%. The treatments were able to be put into one um, tablet, so that, that was taken once a day as a single pill. Again, I, I don't know of any other area where three um, farms, well in this case it was two pharmaceutical companies had worked together to, um, to put their, their drugs into a single tablet. Um, and the number of people on treatment outside of the developed world was increasing first to 1.3 million and then by 2010 to 5.2 million, um, but still a lot less than, um, than was needed. So that gets us to 2011. And, uh, and I guess the trends and, the, uh, and some of the exciting things that have, that have happened. Um, so first, and I'll explain why the, there's been this increase in science, scientific interest in a search for a cure, but certainly the International AIDS Society, the NIH, and a number of the journals started to talk much more about the possibility of a cure. And I'll, I'll talk some more about that in, uh, in a few minutes. It would also, uh, a critical paper showed that, a, uh, that if people were on treatment, that limited their transmission of the virus by 96%. I'll show you some of that data um, and, and tell you why that's, that's so important. And that paper was considered by science 
as the most important paper published in 2011 in all of medical research. And uh, also in 2011, a tenofovir containing microbicide um, demonstrated efficacy, and again, I'll talk a little bit um, more about that. So that brings us to 2012, and I guess um, what, what are the key issues of HIV in 2012? And I think, uh, well, the, this is my view. Someone like Mark might have a slightly different view, and others will have a different view. But I think right now um, we're on the verge of some really exciting prevention um, science. Um, we're talking about the intersection between treatment, eradication, and cure in a very exciting manner. And while we're talking about that, it's intersecting with a, an increasing understanding of, uh, of chronic infection and inflammation and how that needs to um, intersect um, with, our, with our treatments and our management. So in terms of prevention, there's a few things that clearly work and I'm not going to talk about. Condoms clearly work and if everyone wore condoms, um, there'd be very little HIV in the world. Clean needles work, needle and syringe programs clearly work, even though there is a consistent political push uh, against harm reduction and against needle and syringe programs throughout the world. Um, the data shows very, very clearly that needle and syringe programs work, they save money, they do not increase um, drug use, um, but they do decrease the number of people who get HIV and hepatitis C. And uh, I, I haven't, didn't actually even mention it in the history, but the, a few years ago, the, a number of studies out of Africa showed that circumcision reduces um, transmission by up to 60%. Uh, and so uh, it is now an accepted um, public health um, intervention to decrease HIV transmission. But in the last year, and I guess I'm talking predominantly about the last um, 12 to 24 months, the most exciting data I think has been around microbicides and around the impact of treatment on prevention. And I'm not going to talk at all about vaccines, I think we're still waiting uh, in that area and I suspect that's still um, quite a way away. So this um, paper uh, came out in the New England Journal, Prevention of HIV Infection with Early Antiretroviral Therapy. Um, and as I said, this was um, judged by science as the most exciting um, paper out last year. And um, this shows the, um, uh, the way the study was done. Um, and it was conducted over a number of countries, um, but it, it did uh, include uh, Africa or African sites. And, uh, and then you can see here the, um, the, protec the protection that um, treatment provided in terms of transmission between discordant couples. And so there was a, dis there was a significant um, protection um, of uh, people who were discordant, um, but in which there was treatment or delayed treatment. And, um, and again here, this just shows the, uh, the protection um, between uh, couples and, uh, and also shows the, uh, the clinical events. I'm not going to go through that in a, in a lot of detail, but just to demonstrate that um, a relatively simple study, one, uh, but one that had to be done and, uh, and one that took till 2011 to be done, demonstrated that if we treat, the more people we treat with HIV, the less transmission there's going to be. And, uh, and that's a really very important finding because it then allows us to consider the cost of treatment in a number of different manners. So it's not only about treating the individual, and reducing their morbidity and their mortality. It's about treating the individual, individual and reducing the transmission within the community. And so that then has a dramatic uh, improvement in the cost benefit of, of utilizing those drugs. So um, just moving on to the other prevention activity, and that is microbicides. 
and um, <clears throat> microbicides are essentially a female applied gel, a vaginal gel, so they're controlled by the female, which is very important in, in the sense uh, of not relying on uh, males to, um, to put on condoms or to, um, to even discuss HIV prevention. Um, and, uh, and depending on, on the sort of um, microbicide, some of them will actually prevent other STIs. Um, compared to drug treatment, they are relatively cheap. Um, and uh, and I, uh, I'd been involved in this area for some time working with Star Pharma, and Star Pharma had what's called a non-specific viral inhibitor. So that really was a dendroma that was preventing um, binding of HIV to um, the, the cells within the vagina, um, but also prevented binding of HSV and other STIs, and so it was almost certainly doing it in a very non-specific manner. Um, st the Star Pharma product hasn't gone into, into large-scale clinical trials yet, but a number of it, the other non-specific ones have gone into large-scale clinical trials and unfortunately didn't work. Um, probably for a number of reasons, some of which is compliance, but um, probably because their, their activity and the threshold level for infection was, was too low. And so it was very exciting to, um, to see a microbicide go into a large cl cell clinical trial and find that it did work. But it was a microbicide that um, contained an antiretroviral rather than one that just prevented binding. And so this paper came out um, which um, in science, which demonstrated the efficacy and safety of tenofovir gel. So tenofovir is one of the antiretrovirals, and that was placed in a gel and given to a large number of, of women in Africa uh, in a uh, controlled trial, and, uh, and it demonstrated a significant efficacy in reducing the transmission of HIV. And, and so this is the first time that a microbicide gel has been shown to be efficacious, despite hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on large-scale trials with a number of uh, preceding options. And so this, for the uh, microbicide community, is, is incredibly exciting. Um, there are still a lot of issues with microbicide, particularly around uh, compliance and then also how long um, the protection lasts for and also the impact some of the previous um, microbicides had actually increased inflammation in the vagina, and that's obviously a bad thing. So that <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of work to do, and I think um, we actually have the science to make really good microbicides, um, and so I think there will be even better ones after this one. But to actually prove uh, the proof of principle, like the um, prevention with treatment, those things are incredibly important to enable the science to be funded and to continue and to enable the studies, new studies to be done. Because people were really losing faith in microbicides and I think this was probably one of the last clin large clinical trials that was ever going to be funded. Uh, if it, and if it hadn't worked, I think that would have been a disaster. So um, I won't go into the details, but this just shows the, um, the screening and enrolment and, and then if we go to a Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see the, um, the difference between placebo and tenofovir. It's still not um, perfect, and we'd like to see that tenofovir line uh, a lot lower. Um, but uh, it, as I said, it was a proof of principle that was of incredible importance. I'll just flip through the next... Um, couple of slides um, just for the sake of time. So, and move on to um, treatment, eradication and cure. So, um, as I mentioned, very quickly after the, um, the virus was discovered, we started to develop some treatments and, and actually now um, we have some uh, fantastic treatments and uh, we all have um, patients who we've been treating for 10 to 15 years, have had productive working lives, productive professional lives and, um, and uh, are still doing extraordinarily well. The treatments are far less toxic than the earlier treatments and there's diminished side effects as I had mentioned. 
Um, but there's been no evidence of eradication or cure on any of our treatments, despite the fact that we're getting people down to very low levels of viral RNA, um, there's no evidence of, uh, of cure. So this is the, uh, the life stages of the virus, and really um, what, the, uh, what we've been able to do is to find drugs that work at, um, at a number of these um, stages. So there's um, the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, um, there's the protease inhibitors, the, um, and it doesn't come up on this slide, but there's uh, inhibitors at the site of binding, and there's integrase inhibitors down here. So we have um, hit the virus at a number of these areas, and what we found with treatment is if we combined uh, a couple of these and one of these, then we, we would find uh, very effective dramatic drops in viral RNA that would, as long as the patient continued to take the drugs, was, was persistent and prevented the patient from developing immunosuppression and therefore opportunistic infections. And uh, if the, vi the virus, which had the capacity to become resistant to some of these, we, the pipeline for drugs has, has been a, quite a long one, which with around 20 to 30 drugs now available, all acting at these different sites, and so that you can utilise, uh, add in further drugs when you get resistance. Although I must say the experience now in the developed world is that we do start patients um, on some fairly standard therapies, drugs combined into one tablet, take one tablet a day or two tablets a day uh, at night, and they stay on those for uh, five to ten years, sometimes, uh, depending on their compliance need, changes to other drugs, but it really has become very much like um, managing a chronic illness, like managing diabetes, getting people on regular insulin. Um, so that uh, it... Uh, it really has been a, a very dramatic and science, medical research-led um, outcome. And if you look at this, this only goes to the year 2000, but you can see, and you remember the history I gave right at the beginning, that very quickly uh, HIV became a major killer in the population, um, well above all the other well-known um, killers. But with the advent of treatment, you saw this really dramatic decline. And, uh, and actually, if this graph went out further, you'd see this decline even, even further. But that, I guess, begs the question is, is why, do we, why do we need a cure if we've got such good treatments? And, um, and there are a few very good reasons. Firstly, the evidence is that life expectancy remains reduced on treatment, despite the fact that we're keeping the viral load below 50 copies. So, um, so that's, that's one good reason. There is morbidity associated with um, antiretroviral therapy, and Mark mentioned that at the beginning. There's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, increased risk of cognitive dysfunction, and the other issue is the, um, is the cost. And uh, although it's a cost that the developed world can handle, at least at the moment, uh, it's not a cost that we can do, the developing world um, can continue to handle. So the funding is, is a real issue. So if you, if you look here, you look at um, population controls, you can see this is the normal life longevity, and then you can see that Pre-heart, obviously, was pretty low. As we got better and better at highly active antiretroviral therapy, it got higher, but it's not getting back to normal. So a person with HIV, despite the fact that we, can, we have really good treatments, um, will not have the same um, longevity as a person without HIV. And then if we look at, uh, at funding issues, and this is just comparing... Um, 2010 with 2015, you can see the, um, the amount of money, $15 billion, we're spending on, uh, on antiretroviral therapy at the moment, and that will go up to $23 billion by 2015. So the, the question is, can, can we continue uh, to afford that? Uh, and I guess the GFC doesn't help 
And um, just at the bottom, there's a little note saying the Global Fund has suspended its next round of funding because obviously the money for this comes from those very countries that are currently uh, in credit crises and other financial crises. So as I mentioned, the, um, it, it's become a, a, a lot, there's a lot of interest in uh, eradication and cure and the uh, a International AIDS Conference in 2010 was, was talking about it a lot and reviews in, in high impact journals are talking about it a lot. And uh, I guess the question is what, what are the current barriers to cure? And so this shows what I mentioned before that if you have someone on treatment and you're holding their HIV RNA down low, then you stop, it just bounces straight back up to where it was before. So there really, really is a, dr a dramatic rebound when you stop antiretroviral therapies. There was hope that if we could treat them for long enough, then we wouldn't see that rebound, but we do. The other point is that even in people on treatment, if you search for HIV DNA, you'll, you'll always find it um, in infected, and you'll always find uh, HIV infected cells, despite the length of treatment. And in essence, even though we don't utilise these tests clinically, um, in most people on treatment, if you go down to a low enough level, you'll detect some um, viral RNA. So there's always a bit of, uh, bit of virus around. So, so what, what are the barriers to eradication or, or cure? And really the low level viremia and cell associated DNA. And the question therefore is where, where's this virus coming from even though we are, we're treating these patients with antiretrovirals? And, uh, and really the, the key issue is one of the viral reservoirs. So these are areas in the body where the drugs either can't get to or the virus is in a state that the drugs aren't impacting on it, so in a latent state. And, uh, and the key anatomical reservoirs have been the gut, lymphoid tissue, the testes and the brain. And obviously we've worked mainly on the brain. Um, but the, the other areas of, are in, of key importance. And the cellular reservoirs have been subsets of T cells, macrophages, progenitor cells, stem cells, microglia, astrocytes, um, in which the virus is not being uh, attacked by the drugs. So the, the issue is that the, um, the virus persists in, in all patients on, uh, on uh, antiretroviral therapy, and this um, diagram shows that. Um, so that um, you can see that there's cell-associated DNA always in the blood, cell-associated RNA, um, and, but quite low levels of infectious virus. And our um, assays for um, uh, RNA indicate that there is low levels of RNA. And, um, but if you look at tissue, you also see higher levels of HIV DNA and cell-associated RNA. So one of the issues is the, um, is, the, is the state of the virus. So if we have activated T cells that are infected, they produce lots of virus. Sorry about that. But, <clears throat> but because they're activated and they're producing lots of virus, our antiretroviral therapy can be, um, can be utilised. Whereas if you have the resting um, T cell and the virus just gets integrated into the genome of the T cell, but we're not seeing an activation, then the, an the antiretrovirals have nothing to attack and the virus or the viral genome stays in the T cell and we therefore have a reservoir. And so there are pathways that can go obviously in between those two, um, between the reservoir, between the activated T cells and between the production of, of virus. So here we have uh, examples of the latently infected T cells producing virus. When they do produce virus, our antiretrovirals can work, but they don't work um, when, the, when there's no viral production. There is a debate um, ongoing and hasn't really been resolved 
about whether there's actually residual viral replication um, going on from activated T cells as demonstrated in this diagram. And, uh, and obviously our antiretroviral therapy can uh, attack that. And if this was the only source of, uh, of virus, then actually our, uh, we, our, uh, the way we would try and uh, eradicate the virus would be quite different than if the source was from, from latency or from reservoirs. But there are some distinct, uh, we don't think this is the case, although as I said, the debate keeps going. Um, but the problem with seeing this as a major source of residual replica, there being a major source of residual replication is there's no evolution of the RNA or DNA sequences in these patients, so that the, uh, which would you'd normally seen with ongoing replication. There's no development of drug resistance, which is again what you'd normally see. And when we apply treatment intensification, which I'll show in a minute, there's no impact of that on this. So we don't think this is the, uh, the source of virus. But we do, um, we do um, know now that there are major anatomical reservoirs, and, uh, and these are highlighted here, the gut, the brain, testes. So how would we go about a cure? And so obviously the key part of curing HIV is to eliminate latently infected cells. Um, and to eliminate residual viral replication and to enhance HIV specific immunity uh, or it, to make cells resistant to HIV and I'll talk about that um, right at the end. So this diagram shows the activated T cells making virus being uh, treated with the antiretrovirals. Here we have resting T cells with the virus and what we want to do is to get them to go up to there and then we can eliminate them. And if we could do that for long enough, in other words, get the resting T cells to be activated, produce virus and, uh, and be eliminated, then we might have an opportunity to uh, eradicate HIV, at least from the T cell populations. As I said, there were other reservoirs, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, so there, there are ways of doing that, and people are now actually doing this. So there are ways of activating latent HIV in T cells using HDAC inhibitors, um, cytokines, um, some other agents like the anti-alcohol agent, uh, I'm not quite, it's not quite clear how that exactly does do that, um, but it does methylation inhibitors and immune modulation and uh, other activators here. Um, the, these are all ways of getting the T cell activated um, or enabling the virus, um, either activating the T cell or um, changing the environment of the virus so the virus starts to replicate. So the ticks indicate the ones that are already in clinical trials, at least for safety. And uh, these diagrams just show the HDAC inhibitors uh, and how they move um, the virus in a resting T cell from this um, to this. So as I said, there's a, uh, been a major interest and papers in Nature and Nature Medicine talking about um, uh, this area of activating the latent HIV in order to uh, eradicate it. And um, these are a number of the, uh, the trials that are going on, a number of the drugs that are being um, looked at. Sorry, this is in, in vitro, but all these drugs are being looked at in vitro and starting to be moved in, uh, in safety trials. So if we go back to um, diagram of the virus and the virus entering the cell, you can see there are a number of sites uh, in which we could um, utilise drugs to um, either activate the cell or, or activate the, uh, the virus and the replication of the virus or allowing or inhibiting um, cellular mechanisms 
that are, are turning the virus off. Because obviously the cell wants to turn the virus off. And, uh, and so what we're really suggesting here is that we need to inhibit those mechanisms in order to allow the virus to replicate and therefore allow our antiretrovirals um, to, to work. So um, I did mention that um, maybe some people thought maybe that if we were in this situation um, where we still had HIV DNA in the, uh, in the serum, uh, in the blood, and we had low levels of HIV RNA uh, on treatment um, for a number of years, if we then added in more drugs, maybe we could um, eliminate the uh, HIV DNA from the blood. And so if we um, added in um, more drugs, and so in this case we're, we're talking about five or six drugs, unfortunately what we see when we do that is no change to the RNA and no change to the DNA. So that, um, that doesn't work. There are some ongoing trials though where people are looking at uh, intensification plus um, immu uh, enhanced immunity with things like IL-7 and uh, other treatments um, such as uh, a DNA prime um, boost um, vaccine strategy and, uh, and these trials are ongoing. Mark actually might know whether, I haven't seen any results out of these uh, as yet, um, but, um, but they could be very interesting. So, um, so clearly, I think if we're going to eliminate viral replication, um, we need to go well beyond just treating with any retroviral therapy. We may need to reduce the immune activation. I haven't spoken much about that, but I'll be talking about that in a, in a minute. Um, and we may need to have other opportunities like enhancing, enhancing the drugs to the tissue with things like nanoparticles or prodrugs. Um, I did mention making the uh, cells resistant to HIV and I'm not going to go into this case in a lot of detail but there was one case in Germany of a sterilizing cure and essentially this was a patient who had HIV and leukemia and, uh, and required a stem cell transplantation sorry. And, um, and he was transplanted with CCR5 um, delta cells and so they were able to get rid of all his latently infected cells through the treatments um, for his leukemia and, and obviously replacement by the transplant. And then the new cells were HIV resistant because they were CCR5 um, deleted. And apparently um, there's been no, his, his RNA is still undetectable and he's not on treatment. So really, I guess, where we act with activating latent HIV, we're still, we're still a long way away, but it is, I think, exciting that this is where we're at. And we're still wondering about the doses of HDAC inhibitors. We're wondering whether we shouldn't be combina um, have combinations of activating of agents at those different sites that I showed on that diagram. Should we have these activating agents and immuno, immunomodulation? Um, and at the same time, should we have treatment intensification? But I guess it all goes to the point that if we could do all this for a short period of time, say six months or so, that that would be a lot cheaper and obviously better for the patient if we could eradicate the virus over that six month period rather than people essentially having to be treat, having been on treatment for the rest of their life. So obviously in this area, um, ethical considerations are important and we are continuing and always working with the community on these. So what are acceptable risks and toxicities compared to being on well-tolerated antiretrovirals? Um, when we're doing this, um, 
Sometimes there's treatment interruptions, which obviously enhances the capacity for resistance, but also increases the amount of virus uh, in the blood. Um, expectations, obviously, of study participants and community engagement, as I mentioned. So really, in conclusion on eradication, I think it is likely that we'll need combination approaches. We'll need an intense understanding of the immunology of the latent T cell and how to activate that and get the virus out. Um, we'll need, obviously, early proof of concept studies. Um, I think this issue is quite an interesting one, the sterilising versus functional cure. And so I think if we can understand the reservoirs a little better. I think, as I'll demonstrate uh, a little later in the brain, I think there are cells infected in the brain that are lately infected and capable of producing virus, probably mainly microglia, um, that you would need to eradicate in any eradication process. But there are others, like astrocytes, which clearly have integrated virus, but probably there are very few circumstances where the virus will actually ever leave that astrocyte and infect a T cell. And so you could, you could have a functional cure in which you know there are cells, perhaps in the testes, in the liver or elsewhere, that are never, where the virus is there, it's integrated into the DNA, but is never going to come out, or in very unlikely scenarios, um, whereas you've actually um, had a functional cure because you've got rid of all the other cells which have the capacity to be, um, produce virus um, from, a, from a reservoir. Sterilising cure means you've got all the DNA out of the body, and I, I just think that that's um, probably less likely. So that um, leads me to the um, central nervous system as a viral reservoir, and I'm just going to move through this relatively quickly. Um, this is what we've worked on. Uh, we've worked on the brain for the last 15 years or so. Uh, it's important because it's an immune privilege site, uh, restricted penetration of antiretrovirals, and there are cells there that live for a long time. So I'll just flip through these, but these are the criteria for a viral reservoir as determined by the sort of HIV research community, and we believe, uh, obviously, that the brain fits all of those. Um, the virus goes to the brain very early, um, and if you're not treated, then it can often lead to an encephalitis. Um, but with treatment, um, we've seen a dramatic decline in the amount of encephalitis and the amount of dementia. But what we are seeing is ongoing neurocognitive decline in a large percentage of patients on treatment. And, uh, and so what that does have us a little worried that the longer you're on treatment with, as I've indicated, some persistent virus, um, whether we'll see that cognitive decline continue. So uh, I'll just show you a bit of data from our own labs. The first was to prove that there was integrated HIV DNA in astrocytes and macrophages in the brain. And we used a very sensitive um, LUPCR to, um, to demonstrate that. Um, so we, we were able to show um, using laser capture technologies that there was integrated HIV in macrophages and astrocytes in the, in the brains of HIV um, positive cases. Um, so I'll just, uh, we also went on um, to, to look at how often astrocytes and macrophages were infected in the brain. And we did this study where we um, were doing uh, immunohistochemistry for astrocytes, multinucleo giant cells, and microglia and macrophages. And then we were doing laser capture and then looking, at looking for DNA in the uh, laser captured cells. And we were looking at uh, a, a number of regions because we we're interested to know how much virus there was in relation to the blood vessels and in relation to multinucleated giant cells um, and therefore um, yeah, sort of an inflammatory component in the brain. So you can see here we divided it up into region A, B and C depending on the distance um, from blood vessels and CD68 positive cells. <coughs> 
And then we did uh, laser, single nuclear capture using laser LCM, and then uh, a, uh, a very sensitive PCR technology. And um, to make it, uh, this goes on for a little bit with all these uh, arrows and boxes, um, but really what we showed was that the more severe your encephalitis, the more cells that were infected, um, and also going from A, B to C, regions A, B to C, you had more infection. So the closer you were to a blood vessel, or the closer you were to an activated macrophage, the more likely the astrocyte was to be infected. So, um, so it went from 0% in region A up to around 20% of astrocytes in region um, C, uh, particularly associated with severe HIV encephalitis. I just emphasise we really don't see a lot of severe HIV encephalitis in people who are on treatment, so these were obviously off treatment, um, but uh, it still does go to show that a significant number of astrocytes um, were infected. Um, presumably with the virus coming either from the uh, hematogenously or from the, ac the infected macrophage. And the other um, work we've been doing is to look at why these, uh, why astrocytes have, uh, have, are latently infected. And, um, and we've firstly studied the virus in, uh, in the brain and in the non-brain tissue, then in different brain regions, then in different cell types in the brain, and we've done that at the level of envelope NEF, TAT and the LTR. And really what we have shown is that, that this, the virus, as you go through, the, go through in different brain regions and then down compare astrocytes with macrophages, you see distinct changes in, uh, in all of these parts of the virus. Uh, and particularly of interest is TAT and LTR because they are important in the transcription of, uh, of HIV, obviously. And, um, and so we and others have demonstrated that the major blocks in viral production uh, in astrocytes is at the level of transcription uh, at the TAT, LTR, and particularly at the SP1 site. Um, and, um, and again, for the, um, for the sake of time, I won't go in, in, into it too, too, within too much detail. Um, and in fact, I'm probably not the best person to go into the detail, really. Melissa Churchill, who did a lot of this work, is pro would be much better at it than me. Um, but we did find that the SP1 site was, the, was one of the critical areas of, of genetic change in the viruses in the brain and ones that led to, um, we think, might lead to latency. So again, these were the, um, the criteria for the establishment of, viral, um, of a viral reservoir and the red ticks indicate the ones which we have proven for, for the brain, indicating that the brain is a significant reservoir for, for HIV. We'd also done a lot of work on inflammation in the brain and shown that there were um, macrophages both in the brain and in, uh, in the peripheral nervous system or dorsal root ganglia um, that were producing uh, cytokines that increased inflammation and uh, decreased um, neuronal um, activity. Um, and when we were doing that work, and this work was all some time ago, about 10, uh, 15 years ago, we were wondering why we were seeing so much inflammation in the nervous system. And, uh, and we were making hypotheses about T cells and different subsets of T cells, etc. But more recently, um, it's become apparent that inflammation is an ongoing component of HIV. And, uh, and it's probably happening for a, for a number of reasons, but one of the really interesting reasons it's happening is because HIV infection of the gut. So when people get infected with HIV, the virus very quickly goes to the gut, and, um, and you do have a HIV-infected individual has quite a different gut to a non-infected individual, um, leading to um, depletion of CD4 T cells in the blood, in the gut, but more importantly, the capacity for translocation of pathogens. And so there's now been a lot of work on measuring um, parts of pathogens, uh, I'm talking about bacterial pathogens, LPS and other components in the blood and, uh, of patients with HIV. And, and it's now clear that these um, components are causing a chronic uh, 
uh, driving of the chronic uh, inflammation that we now see in HIV that Mark talked about at the beginning. And, and for us, this started to explain why we were seeing inflammation in neural tissue, but it also explains why we're seeing you know, increased amounts of cardiovascular disease and other and metabolic disease in patients with HIV, diseases that again we know are driven by low level uh, inflammatory um, milieus. And so you can see here the, um, the difference between a, uh, a healthy gut here and a not so healthy uh, HIV gut here. Um, with uh, infected T cells, enterocytes dying, blunted villi, and increased permeability. And so uh, Steve Deeks, in this review uh, in 2011, um, started to talk about uh, the role of chronic inflammation in, in HIV. And it was very clear early on with untreated HIV that we had a very inflammatory uh, milieu um, going on. And, uh, and those patients then also had very high levels of virus and then ultimately died from opportunistic infections. We thought when we introduced heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy, that we would lose all of this. Um, but really what has been shown with numerous um, publications summarized in this article by Steve is that we have decreased, a lot less than this, and in some cases, very difficult to measure, but when you do look carefully, you see ongoing defects in T cell regenerative pot um, potential, loss of immunoregulatory function. You still have some CMV and other uh, infections, hepatitis C, for instance, and you still have significant microbial translocation, all leading to chronic inflammation. And in this case, he's concentrated on immunosenescence. Um, but the really interesting thing for me, I think, is how this chronic inflammation impacts on the heart, on metabolic disease, on the liver and on the brain. And I think along with us um, looking at eradication, um, we need to think about how even though we've got really good treatments, this um, potential for clinical disease keeps going. And that's really what I've summarised in this last slide, going back to 30 years, 60 million people infected, 30 million people dead. Very exciting prevention strategies, and I think we always have to understand that public health and prevention strategies are going to be the cheapest way to impact on the epidemic. Um, but for the individual, we have very effective treatments, but I hope that I've shown you some data and some uh, work that's ongoing that suggests that this actually, even with effect, effective treatments, this is a chronic, persistent, low-level infection and inflammatory state. It's not a cure and it's not controlling all aspects of the virus. This is also a problem in terms of affordability, as I mentioned. And so I do think the current may be optimistic, may be, uh, may be even totally impossible, um, but the current search for a sterilising or functional cure I think is really important because we, uh, I think what we'll see as people stay on treatment for even longer, the impacts of this inflammatory state are going to, we're going to see that more and more and we already, as I mentioned, see that in cardiovascular cognitive decline. Um, and we, we're going to have problems affording treatment, particularly in the developing world. So um, I think this is a worthwhile endeavour and I think it's where um, HIV um, research is, uh, is strongly heading at the moment. So just some acknowledgements, but particularly to Melissa, um, who runs the lab at the Burnett, which I still have uh, quite a lot to do with, and Sharon Lewin, who supplied uh, a number of the slides about uh, eradication, has been a long time collaborator, and obviously the people at Hopkins. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve, for a great overview. Um, questions? I'll start with one. So, um, do you, is, is your belief then that the cognitive decline is primarily due to unabated chronic inflammation, or do you think there's still something happening in the brain with the, the resident virus that's causing cognitive decline? Um, 
So I, I get, yeah, and I guess my view is that, so, so just to explain that a bit more, I guess there are two views, which may act, both be happening at the same time. One is that there is ongoing some low-level viral replication with things like GP120, TAT and NEF being produced, which have all been shown in culture to be neurotoxic or particular sequences to be neurotoxic. Um, I, I actually think that's the less likely, and I think that what we're seeing is a... Uh, a very subtle neurocognitive decline happening because of a, a chronic inflammatory um, process in the brain, um, not with the levels of TNF, et cetera, that we were able to measure in people with untreated HIV, because that was pretty easy. We saw a whole lot of it. Now it's very low level, and it may not even be, you know, uh, cytokines like TNF, but it, there, there is that chronic inflammatory um, process that's ongoing. Um, and interestingly, even when you look at Alzheimer's research now, that probably is playing a role in Alzheimer's disease as well. Just the initiation are, is different. Yeah, Louise. Uh, Steve, look, it's a little unfair because I want you to comment on vaccines, and I know you specifically <laughs> excluded that from, from, from your talk, but if you wouldn't mind, uh, you alluded to the fact that, um, that you, you, know, you think it's some time off. Do you think that the fundamental problem like in Louise is that is people could be changed to the, the, the sort of regulatory changes that have come about from the failures and the new increased risk that we're seeing from the risky trials, or is it because the, the candidates they just don't seem to be credible in terms of actually having an effect, good effect on clinical trials? Um, I, I think it's, uh, well, I think it's both, I think the first is a real risk and one that hopefully won't happen, but, and that's why I emphasize with the microbicide, I think you know, if that tenofovir study had failed, that would have been the end of microbicides. And yet, to have a female-controlled HIV prevention strategy is so important. And vaccines are teetering, I think. Um, I think, but I also think that it goes to the sort of ster sterilising compared with functional vaccines. And I think we have evidence that the vaccine has to be sterilising. So it has to be a vaccine that doesn't allow any virus uh, and so I think that the, my personal, and Steve Kent's not in the audience, but that a T-cell vaccine isn't, isn't going to cut it uh, with HIV. So we need to have a vaccine that prevents any cell infection whatsoever. I might just before we, we break for, for lunch, so everyone's invited uh, to come afterwards and ask uh, um, Steve any questions. A philosophical question, small pot of money, where do you think we should be investing um, that money? Should it be in sort of prevention? Um, or can we, do you think we can actually disseminate across prevention and cure? Um, I guess, well, I guess to, to, I guess I've said it in my talk, I think it has to be in both. Um, I don't think we should stop the prevention stuff, obviously. Um, but to only look at prevention, I think, uh, I don't think is appropriate ethically, actually, because I think, you know, there are still a lot of people infected. There are still more people being infected than we start on treatment. Um, and, uh, and we need to be able to ethically say as researchers that we are thinking about how to deal with that problem. Because otherwise, if we only go to prevention, what we're saying is, well, everyone who's getting infected, you know, we're not going to do any more work on that end. We're only going to do it at this end. Now, I don't think we can do that. Well, thank you very much again, Steve, for the great overview.